you guys all know who Brian Brushwood is, I, I assume. Oh, good. Well, they'll tell you. Never <laughs> heard of him. Never heard of him. You used to have big hair. You can actually see him in, in a crowd. He can't anymore. He looks normal now. But that's because he got a gig on the, the uh, what is it? Not, no. Uh, I'm on vacation. He's on vacation. <laughs> but you still but you still have a show on that, Geo. Well, I, I, you're right. We did two episodes of that show. You're right. Yeah, you did. It would be great if there were more someday. Uh-huh. <laughs> don't give me that look. <laughs> that's why you don't have the good hair anymore, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, you call me a sellout? Yeah. Are you a cop? Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, he has the fire sticks up here. That's concerning. <laughs> and then uh, he has books like Da Vinci Code, which if you've been to the, this track for a little bit, you might have heard about that book uh, yesterday with, with, from uh, Annika. Well, let me have Brian Brushwood come up here and give you, actually, this is the very first thing talk I ever thing I ever knew about you. Somebody that knew him sent me a link to his stuff and said, have you ever seen him? And I didn't even know he, he did magic. And so I saw this talk he's going to give you. And I said, I didn't know he did real magic. And so I had him on the show. And he's like, yeah, I do all this such stuff. So I was like, cool. <laughs> so come to Dragon Con. And then he's been here, what, now, four or five years now? Yeah, uh, all of the years. All the, uh, all the years? Oh, yeah. All the years? All the years I've been here. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Come up here. All right. <laughs> don't, hey. be, don't be the voice. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm off on the side. Yeah. Uh, dude, in all sincerity, thank you so very oh. much, Derek, not only for bringing me on the podcast, but for introducing me to Dragon Con. Derek Colin Duno, everyone. Everybody, ne everybody needs to know about Dragon Con. <laughs> yeah. Uh, howdy folks, my name is Brian Brushwood. Uh, I host a few shows on the internet, a little show called Scam School and a number of other things. Uh, here's some truth time, all right? Uh, Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural is a lecture that I put together in 2003 because I was touring colleges all over the United States doing a crazy punk rock magic show, sticking nails in my eyes, breaking bricks over my head. And at the end of the show, people would come up and they would ask like, hey man, I saw that mind reading trick you did. What do you think of that John Edward? And I'd be like, well, here's some stuff you're gonna know about John Edward. And, uh, and I found myself doing an impromptu 30 minute lecture at the end of every single show. And I was like, well, why the hell am I not being paid for this? So so I decided to create sort of a greatest hits of skepticism because when I was in college, I went to a class called Pseudoscience and the Paranormal, uh, uh, written by Dr. Rory Coker out of the University of Texas at Austin, and it was such a life-changing course. It was a thirty, uh, a full semester, like day one, week one, astrology. Here's the here's the way uh, confirmation bias works. Here's the way uh, the forer effects works. Here's here's the actual history of astrology. And once you've read the actual history of astrology, Astrology, it looks stupid as hell and it changed my life right and by the time it was over uh, I realized I wanted to give at least a taste of that to everyone in the world uh, and I was like oh man nobody's going out and, and uh, you know maybe I could do a TV show on this turns out that's the same fucking year Penn and Teller launch bullshit uh, <laughs> Uh, it was not, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay, but anyway, here's here's a second true fact. Uh, so 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 uh, it's a 90 minute lecture. It's free online. How many guys have se actually seen the lecture online? Hands on the air. Okay, good. Uh, just a few of you guys. Have you seen, uh, maybe you've seen parts of it. You don't know. Uh, the the entire lecture is available for free online. All you got to do is type in "scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural." It's broken up into little bits and pieces, and because it uses a lot of mixed media, some of them got flagged for copyright or whatever. Uh, but it's all it's all fair use. Uh, the uh, uh, but. So, so it's a 90 minute lecture and I already only have 55 minutes. Also, lately I've been evolving the lecture because this is one of the most astounding, exciting things to me is as I started doing the lecture, I started to realize students already knew more and more of this stuff. The, in the age of Reddit, in the age of the internet, in the, in the age of, 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 of free communication and argument, uh, a lot of this stuff has kind of, has kind of uh, I don't know, become de, de classe. And so, uh, and then third thing, is um, uh, so, so I've been remixing it with some updated stuff, and finally, it occurred to me as I'm doing it this lecture is so entry level that there's a significant chance that some of the people I reference their work are in the goddamned room, and that's embarrassing to me. So I tried something, and keep in mind, um, uh, 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 true story uh, uh, for, uh, 14 hours ago, uh, one o'clock in the morning. 
uh, East Coast time. Uh, this is this is where I was in in uh, uh, Southern California at the top. Uh, that's a helipad in the background. Uh, and uh, only moments later, I was laying on a, 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 a lean to that I made laying on leaves. Uh, that turned out to actually have uh, animal manure in it. So I, w I was literally laying in shit uh, 14 and a half hours ago. So I, 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 it was overnight because apparently my mission is to be a hobo. Uh, but the, uh, 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 that, that's an odd photo. I don't know why that guy has a camera. Anyway, uh, the, name of the, show to, the name of the show is Scab Sasquatch of the Supernatural. And we're going to start off by, uh, by asking the question, oh shit, who am I? How many guys, uh, how many guys have seen Scam School? Hands in the air. Oh, good. Half you guys haven't. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Scam School is a podcast that launched back in 2008, and we actually got named as a 2008, 2008 nine, iTunes, uh, one of the top podcasts of the year. It's hard to see. Let me enhance that for a little bit. There we go. Okay, awesome. Uh, but uh, if you haven't seen it, let me give you a quick taste of what we do. Each episode teaches you how to mess with your friends and win free drinks at the bar. Here we go. lateral force, but for some reason, this is just a weird quirky thing, for some reason if you stick a quarter to your forehead like this, right? If you stick a quarter to your forehead like this, and you and you hit your head on the table, it will not fall off like, 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 like that, right? I mean, and in fact, I will actually bet you, uh, well, I, I mean, I'll buy your drinks for the rest of the night. Uh, if you're able to get the quarter to fall off in less than three hits, I'll show you. So here, here's what you're gonna do. You wanna set your drink off to the side, actually, and then and, and scoot on in. I'll actually stick it on. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. And then we'll just go ahead. We'll stick that on. All right, you got it. Go for it. Go for it. In less than three. In less than three. Go. Oh, giving myself a seat. Go. Keep going. You're, you're almost there. It's 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 getting loose. Here you go, you're doing good, keep going. Brain damage. You can't get it. I can't, I can't do it. Keep going, you can get it, you'll get it. You'll get, no, no, you just gotta go a little bit harder. Come on! If you angle it down, if you angle it down more towards, you gotta get the downward force. I've lost memories, I can't. <laughs> you're like, I don't remember math anymore. If you put your fingernails over the edge of the coin and push against it, it feels like it's still there when it goes off. But, uh, sorry. So one of the things that, uh, that 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 people ask nowadays is like uh, when you after the fact once you learn that it's 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 an invisible thread or whatever that levitated the object it seems incredibly obvious so all of us are benefiting from the benefit of hindsight looking back where they're like well obviously uh, the 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 fox sisters were knocking under the table to summon spirits or whatever but it turns out that there's a few psychological defects that we all have that cause us to perpetually fall for scams so let's uh, understand when somebody falls for something stupid it's not because they're dumb it's because we're all slightly broken uh, and so in this case uh, you know I, as many of you know I've, I've focused on social engineering which is using cheap dirty psychological tricks to get people to do what you want and a big part of this uh, we're gonna learn uh, let me skip all this uh, understand I'm dumb I know nothing I am an idiot who made his bones eating fire and sticking nails in his eyes on stage across college campuses so if for one second I sound like I know anything whatsoever uh, understand it's because I'm quoting people way smarter than me. For example, uh, uh, Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, is a life-changing book. So how many of you guys have read this book? Hands in the air. Okay, shut up. Go read it. Uh, it uh, uh, I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights of what he talks about in here. One of the things that people respond to are fixed action patterns. They're these blind mechanical responses. Think stimulus response. We see this in mating behaviors for all uh, animals uh, throughout the animal kingdom. Uh, and uh, people have a tendency, well, and, and in fact, scientists have studied this, right? And, and one of the best stories that I read involved the wild turkey. Uh, wild turkey is a very, very smart animal. In fact, it's so smart and clever uh, that uh, Ben Franklin originally suggested it be our national bird, jerk. Uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that, the, you know, it can identify a predator from prey and except when it comes to taking care of its children. Whenever a wild turkey takes care of its kids, it relies on this fixed action pattern. It, in, uh, with the, the wild turkey has a distinctive cheep cheep as an infant, and the moment the wild turkey hears that sound, it will instantly cover and try to, to nourish and protect them. 
The natural predator for a wild turkey is the polecat. So in this case, some uh, scientists, uh, I don't know, got like coked up, and then they, they took like a stuffed polecat and they stuffed a tape recorder in it, and they drug it on a, this is how I imagine it anyway, I don't think this is accurate. They, they drag it over to the wild turkey. First thing the wild turkey does is want to kick its ass, right? And until the tape recorder starts playing that distinctive cheap, cheap sound, and the moment that happened, instantly the wild turkey started to nurture and protect the polecat, right? <laughs> So uh, people are like, oh, but that's just animals. Animals be dumb, humans be smart, am I right? Uh, turns out that there's tons of studies that say otherwise. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, One of my favorite studies is a classic one that took place at Harvard that talked about the psychology of cutting in line. There's been a number of studies about this kind of thing, many of which have been cut short because it turns out that people go ape shit when you try to cut in line. There's a strong psychology, but in this case what they did is they found a copier that was being used. And they found a line and they got a grad student to walk in and try to cut to the line. Now half the time she would walk in and say, excuse me, I got five pages, can I use this Xerox machine? And 60% or 40% of the time they would say bug off, but 60% of the time they would say go ahead, go to the front. This alone blows my mind. You got a line of people, 60% of the time, you could get to the front just by saying, gimme. But they had her walk in with an alternate version that said, excuse me, I've got five pages. Can I use the Xerox machine? Because I'm in a rush. Once she said, because I'm in a rush, it jumped to 94% success rate. Now, this is astonishing to me, right? Now, uh, you would think, okay, she had a reason, they evaluated the reason, they decided it was a good reason, and they, they let her go to the front. Turns out that's not the case. And to prove it, they tried all kinds of nonsense derivations of these, uh, of these combinations, and the magic word turned out to be because. The moment the word because was uttered, it short-circuited everything. All of a sudden, it was like, whatever, she's got a reason, go ahead, I don't care. So they would actually have her say nonsense phrases, but as long as the word because was in there, she'd get to the front. She'd say, excuse me, I've got five pages. Can I use the Xerox machine? Because I have five pages and need to make some copies. Like, that's not a reason. 94% success rates. So understand, we're all just a little bit broken as we go forward in all this stuff. Now, in this case, um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, oh, yes, uh, who, who, uh, okay, so here, understand. Scam Sasquatch of the Supernatural. We gotta start with the scams part here. Uh, what you're about to see is not intended to teach you how to commit a crime, however, to make it seem as though uh, it's the, the easiest way to learn. I'll teach it as if I was teaching you how to commit crime, but we're not committing crime. I don't endorse crime, don't do crime. All right, here's how to do crime. Uh, how, how many of you guys have uh, heard the term short change before? Hands in the air. Okay, good, about half you guys. Uh, how many of you guys know uh, where it comes from or what it means? We think of it as, okay, we, we know it means getting screwed, but it turns out it's actually the name of one of the most prevalent, longest lasting scams in all of history. We are talking billions of dollars, a few bucks at a time every single year. And uh, if, I'm gonna show you the simplest, most distilled version of a short, uh, 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 sorry, short change, and we'll walk you through how, how, uh, how this works. Hey. I need to get some change here. Let me get change for a, uh, a 20. Okay, sure. 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Perfect. Thank you very much. Actually, I don't know what I was thinking here. I actually already have ones. I need to get rid of these. Uh, tell you what, let me get, uh, let me get $10. Okay, there you go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You're a short one. Okay, I don't want to get confused here. We got 9. Let's go ahead and make it 10. 15 and 20, just give me back the original 20, we'll call it even. Sure. All right, how many of you guys thought that looked like a pretty fair trade, hands in the air? <laughs> One sucker, awesome. I, I have a time machine waiting for you, sir. <laughs> but, uh, how many of you guys know exactly who got screwed and for what amount? Ah, not so many hands. What, 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 what was it? $10. $10, that's exactly right. Uh, how many of you guys didn't know what was wrong, but you had the vague feeling that somebody was getting screwed. Hands in the air. Okay, it turns out that that feeling is the only protection. It's the only insurance you need to not fall for this scam. I'm, I'm gonna walk you through the numbers. 11. I love you. I'm gonna come give you a hug and a time machine. 
<laughs> um, so, all right, so here's, here's the way the math breaks down. The con artist originally does a, a real trade, uh, $20 in this case for a 10, a 5, and 5 ones. Now, uh, to complicate things, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll buy a $5 item uh, and then get change or whatever. But whatever it is, the first trade is real. But then the second trade is almost real. So in this case, the con artist sets down $9, which is... Uh, swap for 10. Now, here's the thing. That 10, you'll notice, immediately vanishes from the table and goes in the con man's pocket. Then, but there's something wrong with the money that the con man gives. In this case, we were short one. Oftentimes, they'll mix it up by, like, they'll get to the 10th bill, and it won't be a, a, a 1, it'll be a 10. Whatever it is that's wrong causes him to have the opportunity to use those bills a second time for a second transaction. So in effect, those what there, there was, you were almost right like, when you were thinking like, well, there's got to be $11 or whatever. But uh, but but you'll watch if you watch those ones the second time, you'll see that they get used twice. So the con man walks away with more money. Watch it again. See if you spot it this time. Hey, I need to get some change here. Let me get change for a uh, a twenty. Okay, sure. 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Perfect. Thank so you that's very the much. Real, that's the real actually, trade. I don't know what I was thinking here. I actually already have ones. I need to get rid of these. Uh, tell me, let me get, uh, let me get $10. Okay, there you go. That 10 one, vanishes. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 9. You're a short one. Okay, I don't want to get confused here. We got 9. Let's go ahead and make it 10, 15, and 20. Just give me back the original 20. We'll call it even. Sure. So if you watch, it's a matter of using the same bills twice. Now, here's the problem. Uh, I've done kind of a bad thing in that I, I, I showed you the specifics because I wanted you to have the aha moment of where this comes from. But unfortunately, most people who learn how a short change works now think they're immune because they understand how a short change works. That's not what you should be focusing on. Uh, a, a real short change operation will often involve two people. They'll come up and they'll specifically, one's job will be to distract you while the other one is trying to push their transaction through. When I was 17 years old, I worked at a movie theater, and in my case, it was a two-person operation where they immediately split up to opposite sides of the concession stand in order to pull me and the other guy apart. And uh, what happens is, is you get to this moment where there's a slight moment of confusion, and then the, the helpful volunteer is like, is like, no, 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 that was for that, and that was for that, that was for that. And you're like, oh, wait, that makes sense, yeah, of course. And I got taken for $50 with this scam. Turns out that the only way to stop the short change, because there will be a moment of confusion, the only way to stop it is the single most painful and unlikely thing that you're going to do, which is to stop and say, I'm sorry, I've gotten confused, I need to call my manager so we can go through the till. Modern tills know how much money should be in them at all times, and it's a big pain in the butt, and you have to personally admit defeat on this that you've gotten mixed up. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the one thing that nobody will do. If you guys are running any kind of retail anything, make sure you create a culture where it's okay for people to say that kind of thing uh, if you want to actually prevent this scam. Any questions about this one before we move on? Awesome. Uh, here's what's fascinating to me. Uh, I mean, that's obviously a scam, but, uh, you know, anything from short changes, pyramid schemes, the Nigerian, we've all gotten those print letters from Nigerian princes, print princes. That's a new word. Uh, uh I'm a prince. <laughs> our front, our front. I was sleeping under a lean to mister. Uh, uh, all kinds of scams, but here's what's fascinating to me is that when you mention a uh, con or a scam to a scientist, they're more likely to come up with this kind of stuff. All of these are regarded by scientists as pseudosciences. Uh, I'm assuming since we're on the skeptic track, most of you guys are familiar with what pseudoscience is, but at colleges I have to explain that uh, pseudoscience is defined as claims presented the, so that they appear scientific even though they lack supporting evidence and plausibility. Uh, and I, I would love to get updated numbers on this because I wrote this lecture in 2003. Uh, these were the latest numbers at the time. Uh, in the greatest expansion of information sharing in the history of humanity, in the age of the internet, we saw belief in pseudoscience rise, which is astonishing. And I would love to, does anyone have updated numbers? Do we know if any of these have gone down since 2001 over the last decade or so? <laughs> no, <laughs> people be dumb. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, uh, but if you look at the history of, of, of pseudoscience, many times it's not just that uh, people are misrepresenting or intentionally scamming people. It turns out an astonishing amount 
of today's pseudoscience is actually completely natural phenomena that's been misinterpreted uh, because it's so counterintuitive as something supernatural. And to illustrate that, uh, we'll, we'll take just a moment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk you through something that back in the 1800s, you sincerely could convince people was a supernatural event. Uh, we'll talk real quick through the history of fire eating here. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, the concept of resistance to fire is one as old as history itself, right? As far back as the ancient Greek tragedy Medea, references are made to holding a bar of red hot iron in one's hands to prove innocence or sincerity. The first written account of a fire eater, however, occurs at, don't clap yet. <laughs> occurs in 18, 1607 when Sir Henry Watton wrote of an English sailor who could eat fire as though it were candy. With that in mind, I'm gonna show you guys the simplest method to extinguish a torch with one's mouth. <laughs> you still weren't supposed to clap. <laughs> it, it actually, it is a little more impressive. It looks more like this, here we go. There we go. Now you can clap, there we go. Now the first commercially successful fire eating act went on tour by the six, uh, around the 1680s. It was a French man known only by the name of Richardson who was renowned for his affinity for flame. In fact, it was rumored he could hold one between his teeth and, or, or hold a torch between his teeth just like so, at which point his audiences went nuts. Now by the 1800s, we come to a time that some people call the golden age of fire eaters. This is a time when performers like Yamadeva or Ching Ling Fu or Xavier Chabert, the fire king, these individuals shifted the focus of fire eating away from the tolerance of the heat and the flame. And instead they moved it towards the artistry and the skill with which they manipulated them. There we go. Now by the 1920s, the popularity of fire eating had taken a nosedive. In fact, Harry Houdini of all people, he called fire eating an art over which oblivion threatens to stretch her darkening wings. This is a time when fire eaters were kicked out of the theaters and into the streets, where in order to draw bigger crowds, they began performing increasingly dangerous stunts like the tongue transfer. Or eating twice the flame at once. There we go. <laughs> and re re real quick, I just want to show you my favorite and the most difficult of fire eating effects. This one's called the human candle. There we go. Now understand in an age post, uh, wait, is this gonna play that music forever? That's not right. <laughs> Brian failed uh, at, uh, at, no, don't play. How do you stop the, the thing? Just, we're just gonna groove all nights. Damn you, Dust Brothers. Whatever, just, let's just groove, man, why not? <laughs> All right, so one of the things, <laughs> just can you kill the audio on that? I'll tell you when to bring it back. It'll play forever. Uh, so one of my favorite parts, uh, and keep in mind, man, in an age before YouTube videos, in an age before Reddit, in an age where there isn't uh, discussion between people about exactly how stuff is done, if it's the first time, if you're reading an account of fire reading, that's genuinely going to sound supernatural. In fact, if you read Houdini's book, Miracle Mongers and Their Methods, he actually, with a straight face, says, well, I've heard about some performers who can swallow a flaming sword. As a magician, it's obvious to me that he has previously swallowed an asbestos sheath. 
And so understand that we that 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 we live in the smartest. Uh, seriously, kill that music. I can't. I don't know what I did on that. Uh, uh, we 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 live in an age where. Uh, uh, there's, there's more self-correction for as much as we like to complain about the fact that uh, a rumor will blow up on Twitter and that pseudoscience, you know, people could create their own little bubbles for people to, uh, to, to live in. It is easier to get to the truth than it has ever been in the history of mankind. Um, and now out of the whole scams lecture that I do at colleges, one of my favorite things to talk about is UFOs. Not because... Uh, many people really believe it. A lot of people do believe in them, but because it illustrates one of the most important points out of the entire lecture. Uh, so the story with UFOs is that not one, not dozens, but hundreds of different spacecraft of all different varieties have been visiting us since the 1940s. Uh, all of these are uh, genuine UFOs, by the way. Uh, my favorite is in the corner. You can see it looks like a Buick up there, right there. there. Um, and uh, what's amazing is that we rely on eyewitness testimony for all of this stuff. Uh, stuff, anything from cigarettes being flung out of cars to migrating birds. Have you guys, have any of you guys ever seen that effect when, it, when a flock of birds flies over a street lamp? And it really does look like a UFO. Have, has any of you guys seen that? Two people? All right, dude, watch for it. It's awesome. Uh, but but uh, the, the most common, of course, is natural stars, planets, and meteors because those happen every single night. Uh, all of these, by the way, uh, genuine UFOs. Which, uh, it's astonishing to me that photographic evidence keeps being used for UFOs. Well, <laughs> that's a good one. Which leads me to ask, uh, which uh, are they real or are they fake, right? So uh, this is what's great. And, and I'm stealing all of this from Dr. Rory Coker's class. I went to him and said I want to do a lecture because one of the assignments in his class was that, he, is that uh, for a grade, like we didn't have tests, we had assignments. And one of the assignments was to fake a UFO photograph. So some of what you're about to see are fakes from Dr. Coker's class back in the 1990s. Some are genuinely real UFOs, according to uh, the literature. So we're gonna see if you can guess which one's real or fake. So this one right here, who wants to take a guess, real or fake? 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 Oh, you're right, yeah, that one's fake. What about this one, real or fake? Uh, no, that one's real. <laughs> what about this one, real or fake? Yeah, that was real <laughs> because it, because it looks so shitty, right? That's <laughs> uh, so. Here's my point: is once you start faking these yourselves, and once you see them side by side, and of course, all this has changed in an age of Photoshop. We've all become a little bit more jaded, which is probably a good thing. Uh, but it's but it's totally arbitrary which of these turn out to be real or, or allegedly fake or whatever. So I, if there's one takeaway from this, it's that you can rely on the fact that uh, that, that visual, com visual medium is too easy to fake. You can't accept that as good evidence. Well, so then what do you got? You know, you got the, I guess what, you got, you got stories, right? Carl Sagan, among other people, said extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. You know, if you see, uh, if you see uh, uh, what's the claim about, uh, th if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not unicorns. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, the original quote was, plurality should not be posited without necessity. Willem of Ockham, what do we know that as nowadays? Yeah, Occam's razor, of, sure, of course. The simpler the, the explanation, the better, right? Don't get unnecessarily complicated. So here's a crazy nutty theory, kids. Could it be possible that all over the world people are misunderstanding natural phenomena? Maybe, I don't know. I can't talk for them. Could it be that many more people are misremembering what they've seen? Because keep in mind, eyewitness testimony. People don't just say, I saw a light, so it must be intergalactic aliens. They tell stories about being kidnapped and held down and inseminated and so on. But the, uh, so, so the question, of course, is how good is memory anyway? And this is what turned me on to the work of Elizabeth Loftus, who found out stuff like this. For example, if you, if you take something everyone's seen every day for the entire life and ask them to draw it from memory, like a penny, you get this crap right here, uh, which is amazing. Like, um, I like that one because it looks like Super Mario. Um, but it's like, you get at these details. We remember clusters of information. Like, uh, isn't there wheat on a penny? Well, there was up until like the late 50s. Uh, and you can't, you can't remember, is he facing left? Is he facing right? And this is the nonsense we get. And what's amazing is you look at this, and of course you want to laugh because it's so bad, but how many of us could do any better, right? Here, tell you what, which of these is the real U.S. penny? Just shout it out. Which, which one is the right one? I who said, how many of you guys think it's I? 
No, it's not I. N? Who said N? Who said N? No, it's not N. M? No, it's not M. I have still not heard the right answer. This is awesome. A, right there. Now, here's the thing, is we remember in clusters of information. For example, most people shout I at first because they see one cent. I'm like, oh, no, I definitely remember that being on a penny. It's on the back of the penny. That's exactly right. We're built to not remember things correctly. I want to try an experiment. Every single one of you guys, pull out your smartphone, open up your notepad app. Everyone, uh, normally what I used to do is have every, I'd give golf pencils and cards and have everybody write this down. But, uh, but everybody get ready to write down some stuff. Don't write it down before, because that's cheating. We're going to test our actual memories right now. You guys ready? Is there anyone not ready? All right, hold on. Uh, swipe to unlock. Thumb ID. Code. All right, you guys there? Okay, now turn them face down. Set them in your laps. No cheating. I'll know if you're cheating because I'm psychic. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a list of words, all right? And you're going to have one minute in a moment to write down as many of those as you can remember. Honestly rely on your memories here. You guys ready? The words are sour, nice, candy, honey, sugar, soda, bitter, chocolate, good, heart, taste, cake, tooth, Tart, pie, you got one minute. <laughs> By the way, I have a cash prize for whoever does the best. Oh, yeah, bring back the groove. Nicely done. <laughs> All right, five seconds. All right, how, do you got, how many of you guys think you did pretty good? Hands in the air. <laughs> five of you. <laughs> how many of you guys wish you had another chance? Hands in the air. All right, now you know what to expect, all right? We're gonna do the exact same thing. Just, just hit enter a few times. This will be a different list right here, okay? Same, the, I'm not playing any tricks on you. We're gonna play the exact same game, different set of words, you ready? The words are, and it's, The words are math, math, sorry, math, <laughs> take two. <clears throat> the words are mad, wrath, fear, happy, hate, fight, rage, hatred, temper, mean, fury, calm, ire, emotion, and rage. You got one minute. All right, time's up, time's up. How many guys think you did better on the second test than the first test? Hands in the air. A few of you guys, good. All right, uh, take, a look, take a look at list number one. <clears throat> raise your hand if you, uh, well, for, uh, first of all, how many, well, okay. Uh, raise your hand if in list number one, you got the word sweet in there, hands in the air. Good, about half you guys. Keep your hands in the air, keep your hands in the air. Look at list number two. Raise your hand if you got the word anger or angry in there, hands in the air. 
almost all you guys. If you said yes to either of those, you have experienced a false memory because neither of those words were in either of those two lists. This is how lousy a videotape our brain is, right? This is what magicians rely on. Turns out that study after study has shown that no matter how certain we are that a memory is correct, there's no correlation with it actually being accurate. Uh, and there's tons of stories. I, I, I think we're short on time. I can't tell them all. But uh, one of my favorite is uh, 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 Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, I hope she's not in the audience because I'll be embarrassed because I'm going to tell this whole story wrong. Uh, uh, she, she did a class experiment where she basically divided the audience, or class, <laughs> I call them audiences, uh, into two sides, A and B. They showed them the exact same footage. And it turns out that you can corrupt memories after the fact by asking leading questions. For example, one side, they, uh, they're, they're both shown the exact same uh, footage of two cards colliding. Group A is asked, how fast were the cars going when they collided? Group B is asked, how fast are the cars going when they smashed into each other? And it turns out that when they use the word smashed into, they would estimate significantly higher speeds in group B. They were also asked questions about, uh, was there blood at the scene? Was there broken glass? And the more of those questions that you asked that led people to this corrupted image, the higher they would estimate the speeds in there. There's an amazing story, and, and I forget the details, uh, but <laughs> the, uh, uh, there, uh, there was an air show in the 1950s in England where there was a terrible tragedy, a de Havilland 110 fighter jet broke apart in mid-air and uh, the, the, the foot, everything hit the ground. They got a couple of photos. It was witnessed by 100,000 people. They said, okay, we got some crash footage. We got one photo. We've got, uh, but we've got 100,000 people who, who, who watched it. I just realized that I can't quite tell this story effectively because I've forgotten the exact percentages. Uh, they, they, they sent out a survey of the 100,000 people who witnessed it. I know that thousands gave uh, eyewitness testimonies of what happened. Gosh, I, I just realized I honestly have forgotten the exact number. Uh, I could speak with authority that uh, I, I think it was like literally like three or four people gave an accurate account. Everybody else gave minor differences that differed with the hard evidence that they had. Some people say that the right wing tore off first. It was the left wing that tore off first. Some people landed nose first, Some people, but when it was definitely uh, tail first. But it turns out that we're all really, really lousy. So when it comes to UFOs, we have two main sources of evidence. We don't have hard evidence. We certainly don't have any UFOs that we can all check out. I mean, outside of Elon Musk's rad-ass dragon capsule. Uh, but the, uh, 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 and so because we have photographic evidence that's way too easy to fake and uh, eyewitness testimony, which is way too easily corruptible, to me, that's, that's not very compelling evidence. Uh, I'm going to skip over Bigfoot because he's rad as hell, but, uh, but not real. Uh, the... <laughs> Uh, uh, my favorite story, real quick, when we talked about crypt, uh, cryptids of all varieties, is that uh, uh, in 1979, uh, a, a rare panda was lost from the Bleachdorf uh, Zoo. I hope I didn't offend any Holland residents. Uh, in Rotterdam, Holland, they... <laughs> they put out the word. It was all over the news. They got, uh, they're, they're like, hey man, here's a picture of this panda. It's, it's on the loose. We need to find it. It's super rare, bro. Pretty sure they said bro. And uh, uh, the phones lit up. They got thousands of responses from people like, yeah, I've seen it over there. I've seen it over there. Uh, it turns out that um, uh, later they discovered that it had been immediately run over by a train right behind. So just the mere... Oh, I should get... <laughs> also, that panda was a rapist. <laughs> 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 Man, that was way too easy. <laughs> um, it turns out, so it turns out that once you put an idea out there, people will see something, whether or not it's there. And of course, you know, people were seeing cats or whatever. We saw the same thing. Now, here's the big problem: is like in the United States. Remember, around uh, uh, early 2000s, we had the D.C. area sniper suspect. Somebody made the mistake of saying, "We think he's in a white van," and everything lit up. Like, uh, a lot of I don't want to give a specific number because I'll be wrong. Uh, uh, trillions of dollars were wasted looking for a white van with a sniper in it. And of course, it turned out he was like in a friggin' El Camino or some shit. Um, with, uh, with all the cryptids, you know, whatever. I don't even want to talk about this shit. I'm so mad at it. Um, 
the, play, the, the, play, the guy who started the whole Bigfoot thing was like, by the way, I wore giant feet. Here they are. And everyone's like, no, that's not true. He's real. Uh, but I do love this quote. Uh, uh, Karl Popper, if, if you ever get the chance to read some, uh, some uh, wonderful skeptic philosophy, Karl Popper is the one who said, it's easy to find confirmations for any theory if we look for confirmations, by which he meant that uh, a, a, a million yeses uh, is less valuable than one definitive no. You want to disprove theories. You want to challenge them as hard as you can. And fight, you know, finding a little hair here, finding a little uh, trail of dust over here, it's not like those are cumulative and they all add up to Bigfoot or anyone. You know, if I told you Space Monkey lived right here at Dragon Con and you truly believed it, every time some failure, oh, Space Monkey did that. You know, it's a, you, no, it's not. Uh, so uh, spiritualism, um, I haven't run short on time. Um, hey, guess what? They're all fucking fakes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Daniel Douglas Hume was famous because he, uh, because he never, he quote, never got caught, which is a really good thing to throw in someone's face if you want to prove that spirituality is real. Unfortunately, the reason he was, quote, unquote, never caught is because he never performed in a public demonstration of any kind. He would only perform in private performances, uh, and, and, and by all accounts, he was not the greatest guy, maybe kind of convinced a widow to adopt him in his late 40s and let him inherit her fortune. Uh, but, but when you think of this, oh shoot, I wish we had time for this. Um, uh, ah, damn it, I don't, I, uh, okay, real quick, pretend, pretend I'm talking about how uh, uh, out of all the demonstrations during spiritualism uh, uh, events, uh, table tipping is one of the most impressive ones because if you ever do that, everyone puts their hands on the table and it goes freaking nuts. And uh, normally what I do is explain that uh, this is a very well-known event that we see with the planchette, which is used in uh, a Ouija board or the pendulum. And normally, if I was a smarter man or if I wasn't sleeping in a, under a goddamn lean-to last night, uh, I, I, I would have had uh, all of you guys having pendulums. Have you guys, have you guys experienced the pendulum thing before? Hands in the air real quick. So we don't need to do it. Tell, t t tell your friends how awesome it is. Uh, uh, but... Here's what it boils down to. Uh, and if you haven't seen this effect, I want you to try it at home later on. Uh, you take anything, it could be a necklace, it could be a string, you tie something down to the bottom, you hold it as still as you can, and then you plant the suggestion in someone's mind. You say, imagine that uh, there's a 3,000 year old spirit from Atlantis named Bob, and we're gonna ask him a question. And he's gonna say yes, by moving the pendulum forward and backwards. I want you to visualize that pendulum moving forward and backwards. And even though they're holding it still, sure, shit, it's, it's, it's gonna go forward and backwards. And they'll be like, oh, well, that's very impressive. But then the best part is you're like, now he's gonna change his mind and say no by moving it in a circle. And the moment you say those words, it goes in a circle. It is one of the most astonishing things that you could do to yourself. So as soon as you get the chance, go tie a string to a wing nut and tell me how it goes. Uh, so, so normally, pretend we all just did that and you're all very amazed. Uh, it turns out this is the same technique that's behind dowsing. Now, dowsing, uh, uh, basically, you'll notice uh, there's a billion different ways to douse from pendulums, from uh, the crossed sticks. How many of you guys have seen somebody uh, use the crossed sticks method, like a, like a plumber or something, right? Okay. All of these rely on something called uh, uh, the idiomotor response, right? And this was discovered by Chevrul's, uh, it's called Chevrul's Pendulum, named for Michel Eugène Chevrul, brilliant, brilliant scientist, French dude. Uh, it is called the idiomotor response. And he discovered it because back in the 1800s, uh, people were like, you got to try this dowsing, bro. It's amazing. I'm pretty sure he said bro. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so uh, Chevrolet, he set out a pendulum and he put, and it stayed still. And then he put a bowl of mer mercury underneath. Things started going nuts and took it away and it went still. He's like, holy crap, maybe there's something to this. Except he was French. So he probably was like, sucker crap. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it's, but... It was Chevrul who realized that he could be unconsciously affecting the outcome on all this. So he was the first to do uh, uh, to really figure out the importance of a double blind testing conditions. How I many you guys know a double uh, double blind? Yeah, you're like whatever, asshole. Uh, and then, so so basically, the way he tested it was he set up a partition. So he held his hand out and he had an assistant either set down an empty bowl or a bowl filled with mercury. And once Chevrul did not know what the expected outcome was. 
uh, it, it, it affected, it, it, nothing happened. And then uh, thus the importance of double blind s studies were, were done. By the way, uh, dowsing, still shockingly popular today, as I'm sure you guys know, most of the, w would it be safe to say most of the people who go for the James Randi prize are dowsers? Yeah, mo most of them are? Yeah, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, all of these basically are, you'll notice of all these methods, they all boil down to a precariously balanced object that will allow you to tell you what you already expect to see. Now, uh, again, today you will see uh, plumbers walk in, be like, well, I gotta knock out this wall, let me find the pipes, and they'll go and, and they cross, and then they're just like, oh, well, this must be where the pipes are, and they knock a hole in the wall, and like, there's the pipes, that proves it. Uh, what's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, and that's the number one thing we get, is they already know. My guess is, if you're a plumber, uh, that you have a pretty educated guess as to where pipes might be in a freaking room, right? Uh, but uh, t uh, other people say maybe you got lucky or whatever. Personally, I think there's a very strong business incentive to use the crossed sticks method. Because if I were to just walk into your bathroom and be all like, yeah, we gotta get at the pipes. I don't know, here, ding, ding, ding. Maybe here, <laughs> dink, dink, dink. Uh, that wouldn't go so well. But if I walk in, I'm like, well, let me find your pipes. And you're like, dink, dink, dink. Sorry, the sticks must be wrong. <laughs> and then get, do the other. That's what I think is going on. Uh, uh, man, we're so short on time. Uh, uh, modern spiritualism is basically a rebirth of old spiritualism. And even this, I'm so, this may be one of the happiest disappointments I've ever had. Uh, I wrote this whole section to talk about John Edward, and most people don't even know who he is anymore, and I couldn't be happier about it, right? Um, there's, it's, I, I play, play the clip from about cold reading. You guys know all this crap. Um, uh, talking about ESP, right? Uh, I, I used to normally, um, whatever, tests, people can cheat at tests. Um, there's lots of people who caught cheated at tests, but here's the thing, nobody, most people who still believe in ESP don't believe, well, so-and-so test said it was true. People believe in ESP because they had a personal experience that meant something to them. Uh, and so, here we go. Personal experience plus misperception of chance events is the most powerful cause for ESP, by which I meant we're all broken in the brain. We think wrong about statistics. Let me show you. For example, the, uh, how many guys have had that where you went to the phone, you picked it up? <laughs> wow, I can't even tell this story now because nobody... But how many of you have been... I, I, we don't have landlines anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but back when there were landlines, you'd pick up the phone and the person would be on the line. You're like, oh, we have ESP. So pick whatever. Uh, uh, so imagine you get... Man, the other story I used to tell was about going into the car thinking of a song, turning on the radio, and there it's playing. Who the, who the hell uses a radio anymore? <laughs> Whatever, the point is, is that the odds of one particular co coincidence are extremely low, right? The odds that tomorrow afternoon at 2.47 p.m. I'll turn on a car radio and, and hear the Humpty Dance playing uh, is extremely low, but the odds that over the time, uh, over my lifetime of all the songs I'm thinking of and all the times I turn on radios, because it's 1987, uh, that, that there'd be a match are very, very good. And so you can see this. For example, uh, man, how many folks do we have in here? What is it, like, like, like 200, 250? Let's just take the first section. Let's take everybody ahead of the tech station there. Look around, everyone look around. See, uh, take a guess at how many folks there are. And in your mind, Guess, what are the odds that two people just forward of there have the same birthday? Uh, in your mind, uh, well here, let's say, in fact, let's say even fewer people, right? What are the odds with 23 people in the room that two people would have the same birthday? Would it be 23, you figure out, 20, 23 people, 365 days, 23 out of 365? Or with 35 people, 35 people, 365, let's try it. Um, I'll tell you what. I'm going to take a poll before I show the answer. How many guys think the odds are uh, for 23 people less than 25%? Hands in the air. Between 25 and 50? 50 to 75? 75 to 85? 85 to 100? All right. What about 35 people? 35 people, 0 to 25? 25 to 50? 50 to 75? We'll say 70, uh, 75 to 85, above 85%, get this, 
Two people having the same birthday in a group of 23 people are 50-50. Two people having the same birthday in a group of 35 people are 85%. And we can prove it right here. I, I, everyone, everyone ahead of the tech station, if you hear your birthday, I want you to say, holy crap, that's me. Uh, what, what's your birthday, sir? July 2nd. July 2nd. March 28th. March 28th. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is why casinos stay in business. It's because we're all broken about statistics, right? Tell you, what about this one, right? Imagine I have a totally fair quarter and I flip it 10 times in a row. What's the most likely result, right? Is it heads, 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 heads. Tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, or tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, tails, tails. See? You're all wrong. All three are exactly equally likely. But think about it. Now, when you think about it in reverse, like, like here's the way we think of this. We're like, we're like well, that's not going to happen. And you're like, and I ain't never seen that. But I've seen something like that before, right? But that's dumb reasoning. Take it in reverse. What if you're thinking like, well, that's not very pretty. Well, that looks fairly organized. And that one's the prettiest of them all. <laughs> it's, we're broken in the brain. If you, think, if you break it down mathematically, uh, think about it. What are the odds that the first one's going to be heads? What are the odds the second one's going to be heads? What's the odds the second one, third one's going to be heads? It's 50-50 all across. By the way, all of these are two uh, to the whatever power, two to the tenth power, uh, one in, in, in a thousand, basically one in a thousand. All three are equally likely. Uh, w whenever you talk to someone about ESP, uh, they're going to tell some story about an amazing coincidence. And everything I just told you could be summed up in one statement in an infinite universe. Unbelievable coincidences are bound to occur. It would be weirder if we didn't have incredible coincidences like this. And there's, there's all kinds of amazing conceptual problems with the ESP. That if you feel like arguing, I don't recommend arguing. It doesn't get you anywhere. But if you want to argue, people are like, well, what organ senses ESP? We're like, well, the brain. We're like, no, the brain processes things. It doesn't sense crap. It just uh, intuits from other stuff. You know, like, well, if ESP was real, wouldn't we see an uh, animal evolve that uses ESP in order to find people? Uh, basically, all of ESP boils down to target guessing games. And of course, the JREF. That's your, that's your hammer at the end. You're like $1,000. Uh, most of you guys... Uh, most of you guys know about homeopathic medicine, right? It's probably the biggest thing in the skeptic community. Um, uh, there's a lot of really good nuanced debates about why homeopathy is nonsense. I just like to point out that, uh, that, that Hahnemann uh, was famous for saying like cures like, which sounds pretty great. He also believed that all disease was caused by syphilis, venereal warts, and the itch. <laughs> That's your boy, homeopathy. <laughs> And of course, you know, and, and again, you'll point out stuff like, uh, uh, oh man, we, we're, we're out of time. Uh, magnet therapy, um, uh, da, 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 da. look, uh, basically, all health remedies, let's just, let's just, let's just nail this right now. Uh, no matter what it is, uh, your disease could get better, stay the same, or get worse, right? So if you apply a nonsense solution to it, there's only three outcomes. Either it stay, gets better, in which case you say it works, uh, it stays the same, you say we stop the progression, or it gets worse and you're like, well, we just need some more of it. Uh, and uh, uh, placebo effect, by the way, man, read some stuff on the placebo effect. We've learned so much about the power of the placebo. We've learned that red placebos work better than blue placebos. We know that big placebos work better than small placebos. Uh, we know that we know that there's a nocebo effect, where, which is how witch doctors were literally able to kill people by shaking the death bone at them. And you're like, well, I guess I'm dead now. And they're like, uh, what's the point? I'm, I'm not even going to eat. And, uh, and then, <laughs> Uh, there's some amazing uh, experiments uh, of, 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 of uh, amazing experiments where people, uh, uh, I don't have time, I don't have time, just kill it. Uh, I'm sorry, it's all online. Uh, let, let, me, let me ask you this right here. Um, I got, they got six minutes, I swear. Uh, okay. Uh, in the last five minutes, let's talk real quick about how it is that, p that people who perpetrate uh, pseudosciences get ahead. Uh, part of it is because they're able to create a cult of personality by taking advantage of those same fixed uh, psychological backdoors that we talked about before. One of which, according to Robert Cialdini, is liking. This means that people who you like are willing to grant favors more often than usual. Uh, and so, uh, so 
in this case, um, there's a bunch of, of, of testimonies about this, but, but what I like to talk about, and by the way, the best book, if you want to get people to like you, is still the oldest, uh, uh, How to Win Friends to Influence People. They, uh, uh, he talks about how there's no sweeter sound than the sound of one's own name. He talks about remembering people's birthdays, not using Facebook, uh, uh, is, is a good way to do stand up of, of, above. Um, and uh, I like to talk about how you could get out of a speeding ticket just by using this little back door. Uh, if you get pulled over, there's a couple of things to remember. First of all, relax. It's just a ticket. It's not the end of the world. What happens if you make it a big deal in your head, you get a shot of adrenaline. A side effect of adrenaline is that your, your fingers start to tremble naturally. I used to, every time before I got on stage, think, uh, oh man, I'm, you know, I, I must be nervous about performing because my hands are finger or uh, tr are trembling <laughs> I was under a lean to last night uh, and, the, uh, and so uh, and eventually I was watching a poker tournament and one of the experts was was talking about that fact because somebody had a hand that was so good he had that rush of adrenaline and it wasn't that he was scared to play or whatever but the, the side effect of the adrenaline is that his fingers trembled and as he picked up the, uh, the, the chips and went to throw them there was a tremble in there so when that happens so make sure that you relax if you look nervous they're going to get nervous and it's not going to go well second of all don't cry they get that all day long it's hard enough they're like ah oh, look I'm very very sorry that now I have to write you a ticket and feel bad. That's not going to get you anywhere. If you can get a police officer to laugh, you win, as far as I could tell. Uh, my friend Mike Super, who was recently on America's Got Talent, uh, uh, taught me his routine. We both drive a lot. When you drive, we're not bad drivers. It's just that if you drive long enough, sooner or later, you're driving five or ten over the speed limit and they pull you over. But... Uh, one of the so so basically it's a whole routine that we had and uh, uh, the moment I got pulled over before I uh, he asked for the license the first part that uh, that I would do is well I, my license took care of it because that's my picture <laughs> <laughs> and like 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 seven times in a row they just saw that and then let me go uh, <laughs> but then but then they would ask for insurance they were like well I'm an officer this is a rental car I'm afraid I can't uh, but I do have one of these uh, we're, like, <laughs> we're like oh you don't you, you don't accept these in this state what about this no okay um, Basically, my friend uh, uh, Brett the Amtrak around Seville put it perfectly. He said, I figure the moment I get pulled over, I, I see his whole thesis is there's no way this cop would give a ticket to his friend. So I figure I've got three to five minutes to become this guy's friend. And that's the whole thing is the uh, best way to, to, to have a friend is to be a friend. Another way you could get people, and this is huge in the pseudoscience world, is reciprocation. Um, Whenever we're given something, we feel like we have to give back. I'm going to try to make this fit in two minutes here. Uh, Dennis Regan did an experiment where he, uh, uh, they did a, fa a fake art appreciation experiment. They got a bunch of people to come in and rate art, whether they loved or hated it. What they didn't say is that one of them was a real tester. The other one was a fake tester working for the university, right? Halfway through the day, fake tester leaves, comes back. Half the time he came back with nothing, other times he came back with two Cokes. He's like, hey man, I got myself a Coke, here's one for you as well. And then they went back to rating art, right, all day long. Then at the end of the day, both groups had Mr. Fake Tester say, hey man, we're doing this raffle for work, I could win a, you could win a Corvette, uh, it's all for charity, as many as you could buy, the more the better, right? Uh, and then they, uh, uh, it turns out that under reciprocation, when somebody got like a 50 cent Coke, people were twice as likely to buy raffle tickets than without. Now you might think like, uh, like oh, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe they liked the guy because they bought him a Coke and that's why he bought twice. Turns out they did tests and even if the guy actively hated the other tester, he still bought more once he, once he got him a, a, a Coke. We hate owing people something. And that's, uh, the, the, the Hare Krishnas used this to great effect. They used to go up and down the street, make a lot of noise. Uh, it, it was great at getting attention, really lousy at getting people to join their, their organization. So they switched to giving away flowers or copies of the Bhagavad Gita. And then they would say, uh, they were like, oh, you know, uh, here's a gift. It's uh, no obligation, it's for you. Oh, BT Dubs, would you like to donate? And then they would get the money back. Somebody would go, they'd take the flower, throw it in the trash. They'd go pull it out of the trash. And then giving it back to the next guy over and over and over again. All right, we're down to the last minute, which means, um, uh, crap. Just uh, wa uh, 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 watch this hilarious video on Scam School. Turn up the audio. You can karate chop down and break that one on top. 
just break it right in half, I will buy you a beer. Here we go. And the question is, can he get it? So if you're not familiar with that gag, all you, all you got to do is uh, is have them set up like a football post goals on either side of a matchbox. Uh, matches, so 90s. Uh, and then uh, put the thing on top and tell him to break it. And in doing so, he'll he'll hit it down and burn himself. And uh, crap, man. Uh, if you'd like 28 more hours of content, just look me up online, Scam School. I'm Brian Brushman. I love all of you guys deeply. Thank you so much. <laughs>